يا ربي لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضاء ولك الحمد أبدا 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 الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنهم إن يظهروا عليكم يرجموكم أو يعيدوكم في ملتهم ولن تفلحوا إذا أبدا رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند, الله عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين In today's khutbah, inshallah ta'ala, I want to share with you some thoughts and some reflections that are gathered from different sources and different ulama about an ayah that is very close to my heart in my own life personally. This is an ayah that belongs to Surah Al-Kahf. This is the 20th ayah of Surah Al-Kahf. And for many of you that are accustomed to reciting the surah every week, you'll find the ayah very familiar. I recited it in the Masnoon khutbah in the beginning. And in this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us something very powerful about these young people that are described in the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. These young people lived in a society where overwhelmingly that society was dominated by kufr, by disbelief, and by shirk. And it was not a society of Muslims. And these young people, these fitya, as Allah describes them, were able to hold on to their iman and they were able to hold on to their Islam even though they were living in a society where everything about that society was calling them to the opposite of Islam. They were still able to maintain their iman. And of course at the end of it all when their life itself was threatened they resorted to find refuge in a cave. Many of you are familiar with the story. This khutbah is not about the story itself. It's actually about one very small part of this narration that Allah tells us Himself and He decided that this should be part of the eternal guidance of the Qur'an, the timeless gui guidance of the Qur'an. And especially, I, I hold this story very dear to my heart entirely because for young people especially, this is timeless guidance. When youth are looking for guidance in the Qur'an, there are many places and it's one of the special places in the Qur'an where youth will find guidance. Because these are youth in a difficult society and they're trying to hold on to their Islam. So now as they wake up, Allah put them to sleep for many, many years. You know, فَلَبِثُوا فِي كَهْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةٍ سِنِينَ وَزْدَادُوا تِسْعَةٍ So, you know, 309, that many years they're out, they're asleep, and then they wake up, and they're feeling hungry. And then they give each other, you know, they talk about what are we going to do? Should we go out and get some food? And they, they have this conversation. And so they pick one of them, and they give whatever money they have, and they're sending him out. So they, they, you know, after having a discussion in the previous ayah, the ayah I'm not sharing with you today, they had a discussion about who should go out, what should they go, how should they go, how should they behave. Be very, very careful, watch your step. Don't let people know, because they thought the authorities are looking for them. They're fugitives, they're hiding from the law. So watch out, when you go, be a little covert, you know, don't make yourself too obvious. And go and don't let anybody realize who you really are. Be extra careful. All this advice is being given to this one guy who's going to go get food for everybody else. 
But as he leaves, one last advice is given to him. As he goes back into society, one last bit of advice is given to this young man. And that's the advice I want to just base my entire khutbah today on. The ayah is, إِنَّهُمْ إِنْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ يَرْجُمُوكُمْ أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ وَلَن تُفْلِحُوا إِذًا أَبَدًا One statement. And it begins with, إِنَّهُمْ The Arabic language is very powerful. The word inna is used, they say harf at but it's used rhetorically in Balagha for a couple of reasons. It's used by someone who completely believes what they're about to say. They have absolute conviction in what they're about to say. And also, it is used when the person you're talking to is not so sure. They say, harf inna to feed izalat al shak. They say one of its benefits is it gets, removes doubt, removes, removes kind of. I'm not so sure, I'm a little skeptical. I don't think that's that bad of a deal. But you want to make someone realize what I'm about to say is super important. You better make a big deal out of it. It's not something small I'm telling you, you use inna in the Arabic language, especially in old Arabic. So he says innahum, or the, the, you know, one of the youth is saying to this young guy who's going to go back out there, he says innahum, there's no doubt about it. I want you to understand very clearly, the threat I'm about to warn you about has no, it's not a slight possibility, it is an absolute danger. That those people that you're going to go out to, in yadharu alaykum, if, if it happens, that they find out about you. Zahara ala is complex language, I'll take a little bit of time to explain it. And then we'll go through some of its benefits. Zahara ala, they say in Arabic, for example, Fulanun la yadharu alayhi ahad. That in old Arabic means, this, kind, this guy, nobody can overpower him. This guy is serious. Nobody can take him on in a wrestling match or an arm wrestling. Nobody can beat him in poetry. Nobody can mess with this guy. La yadharu alayhi ahad. Zahara ala also is used in the Qur'an, for example, الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَىٰ عَوْرَاتِ النِّسَاءِ It's talk, talking about young children that haven't hit the puberty age yet, so they don't find women attractive yet, they haven't hit that age yet, they're not, you know, puberty hasn't hit them yet. So Zahara ala is also used in the meaning of finding out. They haven't discovered puberty yet, they haven't hit that age yet. That's the second meaning of Zahara ala. So the ayah is saying, if they overpower you, if they overpower you. Zahar ala also means to overpower someone. To go after someone and catch up to them and defeat them. I want you to think of the image of two people fighting and one of them has taken such a beating that he's down on his knees and he's showing his back. Because Zahar literally is the back. So Zahar ala is used when you beat someone down and they're on the ground, they're on their knees now, they've been defeated. But the other meaning of Zahar also to become Zahir. To become obvious. If they find out who you really are. If they discover who you really are. Now, before I go further, you have to understand Allah used the word in. And this youth is being quoted with using the word in if, which we translate as if. Not idha, which was be when. When they find out about you, this is this will happen. He didn't say that. He said if they find out about you. If they find out about you. So the threat is real. The, the danger is real. But it's not inevitable. It's not guaranteed that you'll get in trouble. There's a possibility. What we learn from the word in is that the believer, even if there's dangers and there's fitna and there's trouble, we don't have to be pessimistic. We don't have to say, yes, there's danger, there's trouble, there's fitna, I'm gonna fall in it anyway. A lot of young people are like that. They're like, man, society is so messed up. Everywhere I turn, there's girls, man. Everywhere I turn, there's like, all my friends are doing this and that, all these drugs, all these other things. I can't help it, right? There's no escape. If there was no escape, the word idha would have been used. If there is an escape, then in is used. If this happens, not when this happens, because when is inevitable, It'll, it's bound to happen. But they said, the, the, they didn't deny that there's a fitna out there, but they did say it's a possibility you will fall in it, and there's a possibility you'll be safe, so be very careful. And the threat is very real. إِنَّهُمْ إِنْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ What are the two things that might happen if they find out about you? What are the two things that might happen to this young man if he's discovered and they overpower him, they arrest him, they beat him up, whatever. Possibility number one, يَرْجُمُوكُمْ They will stone you to death. Rajam. They'll execute you. They will kill you. They're, this is, seems like it's not something that would happen in our society, in America. I mean, your you're young people are holding on to their Islam. And it's not like somebody's trying to kill us if we hold on to our Islam. That may not be the case, but it's a big reality in many parts of the Ummah today, isn't it? Somebody even holding on to their Islam looks like a threat. What's happening to the youth in Syria that are holding on to their deen? 
What's happening to young people in Bangladesh nowadays? You know, this is a reality. When, when young people are clearly holding on to their religion, there are some in society that hate that. They hate it. They don't mind old people coming to the masjid. They don't mind an 80 year old coming and making Salat al Fajr. They don't care. When they see an 18 year old, when they see young people, more and more of them attending the Jumu'ah, not like c catching the Salah in the second rak'ah, but coming before the khutbah begins. And they're listening to the whole thing. When they find this kid spending a lot of time in the masjid reciting Qur'an, this young boy, young guy, 23, 24 years old. When they see young people that are not, you know, they're not shaping their beard like four hours on, in front of a mirror, like turning a little tiny pencil, they've actually got a beard on their face. They don't care about fashion statement. They just want to follow some sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa And there are some in some societies that get very worried. They get very threatened by that. And this threat is even ancient. Even back then, if they see you as holding your Islam, wearing your Islam, making your Islam obvious, they will stone you to death. That is the first danger that is described. And for them, that danger was immediate. It's not some possibility. Obviously, the court had already decided that these people are supposed to be executed. So they were on death row. These guys were on death row. So when he's going back, it's very real for him that this might happen if he gets caught. That's number one. But then, the even bigger danger is mentioned. And the second danger in the ayah, the same youth is telling his friend, listen to me very carefully bro, when you go out there, you might get stoned to death if they catch you. But that's not that bad. Because even if they stone you to death, you'll be a shaheed and you'll end up in Jannah. Even that is bad, but it's not that bad. Because at the end of it all, you're still, you're still successful. Here's another danger when you go back out there. And it is even more dangerous than being stoned to death and being killed. That's the danger I want to talk to you about today. He says, أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ I'll give you a, a simple modern American translation first, then I'll dive into the words and what they mean. Or they will assimilate you. Or they will integrate you. They will turn you into one of them and you won't be able to tell the difference between where your Islam ends and where their kufr begins. They'll make you one of them. That's the modern American translation I'm giving you. Well, not, let, let's explore the words. Oh, you read or they will bring you back. يعني هؤلاء الشباب كانوا كفار فأصبحوا مسلمين. They used to be kufar. They used to be in that lifestyle. They were living it up. They were partying. They were having their life. There was nothing haram for them. Young people that don't have Islam, there's nothing haram. Nothing's forbidden for you. You do whatever you want. Like the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-dunya sajdun mu'min wa jannatun kafir. The dunya, this world, is a prison for the believer. This is haram, that's haram, can't look over there, can't do this, can't eat that, can't smoke that, you know, can't drink that, everything, there's restrictions all around you. But for the kafir, everything's halal. There's, he doesn't have to check the ingredients. He doesn't have to think twice about doing something, he just does whatever he wants. These young people were young people, guys hanging out together, doing whatever they want. Have you ever seen on the street young people, non-Muslim young people hanging out together late at night? You'd cross the street and go the other way, because these guys, you don't know what they can be, they're capable of. They do whatever they want. They could do, and even, especially when they're together, they get worse. When there's one, one young guy by himself is bad. When there's like 10 of them walking down the street, it's trouble. <laughs> it's just trouble. So now he says, one of the dangers is they will pull you back into your kufr. They'll take you back the way you used to be. Because you know right now your iman is strong because you're with your brothers. But you're gonna leave your brothers right now, you're gonna go into the city by yourself. And when a young man is not in the good company and he's by himself, his iman is in trouble. And he can find bad company and they can suck you right in. They don't have to have police after you to suck you, suck you back into that kufr. They just have to show you some, tempt you again, put you in some fitna situation. You go back out into the city and you meet some old friends that you used to do some bad things with. And they're like, hey, just come on, man. Let's just have a chat. Let's just have a couple of drinks. Just sit down. Let's talk. You know? I don't know what that is, but... So they, 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 there's a threat that you might be tempted to go back into that lifestyle. You might start asking yourself, man, ever since I became Muslim, they're trying to kill me. I have to live in a cave. It's not even that comfortable to sleep. We can't even find food for ourselves. Why did I take all this trouble on my mind? Life was so much easier when I was kafir. It was so much easier. Why don't I just go back and just be the way things were? 
And he, the, the, the believer, the Muslim youth might be thinking, I will never be like that, man. My imam is not that weak. I can handle it. I can go out there and manage myself. But you know what? The ayah is saying this, and Allah recorded this as part of Qur'an, this advice that one brother is giving to his other brother. This advice is so powerful that Allah decided that for every generation of Muslims that will come until Judgment Day, they should take from this advice. Which means the threat is real. Our iman as strong as we think it is. We even then ask Allah, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِهْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا We ask Allah that. Allah, don't deviate our heart. Don't let our hearts get deviated. After you've guided us. Just because we have guidance now, we're not guaranteed guidance tomorrow. And especially for young people, who might have a past, and that past can come back, and it might tempt you. And you might even, shaitan might even make you think about it. Like some of you have made tawbah, you used to have a wild past. And you made tawbah, and you changed your life. You're not like that anymore. But sometimes shaitan comes, man, you miss those days, man. What you used to do? Oh, that was fun. Too bad it's haram. You know, but I wish. Shaitan comes and makes you think like that. It's not you wishing. It's shaitan feeding you those wishes. I will fill them with wishes. I will fill them with wishes. They will make tawbah. They will come back to me. But I'll make them think, man, come on, don't you miss it back in the day? The partying, the drinking, the friends, the girls, the this, the that. You'll think about that. The thought will cross your mind. And that's the time to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. That's the time to say that, young man. So he's going back, and the threat is given, you know, إِنَّهُمْ إِنْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ يَرْجُمُوكُمْ They will stone you to death. That's, a, that's one threat. But a bigger threat, أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ Or they will bring you back. They will take you back. You young people have to protect their iman. One of the things I want to talk to you about, inshallah, in these 10 minutes that I have left, in regards to this ayah, I use the word assimilation. The United States, we call it, you know, when we go to high school here, and we take, uh, you know, world history class or, you know, global history class. Then we call, Amer even American history, we call America the melting pot. That's one of the phrases that's used in sociology to describe United States culture and, and society. The melting pot. Different cultures, different immigrant populations come here and over time they all just become American. They used to be Chinese and they used to be, you know, Asian or they used to be African or they used to be whatever they used to be. But two, three, four generations down, they're just American. And they're all, they all basically have the same values. But you know what, there are some communities that are able to hold on to their cultural identity more so. I, was, I spent most of my adult life living in New York City. There are neighborhoods that have been Chinese neighborhoods for 50 years. There are neighborhoods that have been Greek neighborhoods for 60, 70 years. And they still, all the signs are still in Greek. You know, there are neighborhoods in Astoria, Queens, where all the signs are in Bangla for 30 years. Everybody on the street speaks Bangla. There, there are neighborhoods like that. But... You know what? That's still assimilation. Because assimilation is not just about, oh, I want to keep my language. Or I want to keep my traditional clothes. That's not, that's not a problem. You can keep whatever clothes you want. Real problem in assimilation is when your definition of what is right and what is wrong changes. You could dress however you want. You could dress in Eastern clothing or Western clothing. But if your definition of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, what is permissible and what is not permissible, what is good and what is evil, when those definitions start changing, then there's a problem. It's not a problem if you're not eating traditional Somali food anymore, and now your kids just want to eat pizza and burgers. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. But the problem is when they don't care about halal and haram anymore. That's the problem. When they don't care about fairness anymore. When they don't care about haya anymore. When they don't care about watching their tongue anymore. When they don't care about backbiting anymore. When they don't care about consumption anymore. When these things change, that's when we've lost a generation. That's when a problem happens. So you can have people of different cultures and different backgrounds, but they're still assimilating. Not by tongue, not by language, not by clothing, but by values. Values are the things that Allah gave us in this deen. These are the qiyam of Islam, the values of Islam. The value of salat, for example. When a young generation has lost its salat, like Allah describes, فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفُنَا بَعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهْوَاتِ وَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَا غَيَّةً An unworthy generation came after them that wasted the salat. They didn't have any value for the prayer. That's a lost generation. So what if they speak your local language? That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. 
So now Allah says in this ayah, they will take you back. But take you back into what? Fi millatihim. The word millah is translated in, in some of us who don't call it deen, yani religion. They will take you back into the old religion. But millah, the Arabic word, they, there's many derivations from that word. Milla is for example, malla thawba mallatan. They say when you stitch clothing, they use the word malla from the same root origin. The idea is of a nation that is bonded together, that stay together. And it's very hard to pull out once you go into that milla. We are also a milla. Yaqul subhanahu wa ta'ala wa yusammina millata abikum Ibrahim. You are the milla of your father, Ibrahim. That means we're a religious community that are bonded together. And it's very hard to pull out. Milla also they say, Maliltu minhu. In old Arabic they say, I hate that guy. I can't stand him. Milla also means you have a love for something and that love is also driven by your hate of something else. We are the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam because we love Tawheed and we also hate shirk. We hate shirk. But when the kuffar are a Milla, then what that means is they love some things and they hate some other things. We love Tawheed and hate shirk. What do they love and what do they hate? They love their desires. They love the culture of doing whatever you want. You know, this, this narcissistic, I am above everything else, the ananiya culture, the ana above all, I above all. You know, that culture, they love that. And they hate anyone who goes against that. They hate anything that challenges that. The first thing we say in Salat, when we start our Salat is, Allahu Akbar, we put our ana aside. We make Allah supreme, not ourselves. We put ourselves as secondary. We put our faces on the ground and we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Allah the Most High when we are the most low. We are a culture of putting ourselves as secondary and Allah as primary. And you have a nation of, a, a millah of kufr that wants to put itself, I, I, what, what I want. What I want to eat, what I want to look at, how I want to please myself, how I want to live my life, my lifestyle, my choices, my, 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 I, I, I. That is first for them. So they hate anything that goes the other way. They hate anything that calls to the other side. And the biggest threat they see is young people that can deny their, their temptations. Because when you're young, you're strong, you're independent, you're capable, you're good looking. All these things are in your favor and you can do whatever you want. And even though you can, your dunya is in your hands and you still drop it and say, I prefer deen, they see that as a threat. They see that other people might be attracted to this lifestyle. They might not want to live a life of animals anymore. So they come after young people and they want them to assimilate. So you'll find Muslim youth in America, in Australia, in England. They're living in societies that are predominantly non-Muslim societies. And I don't call them evil societies. There's nothing wrong with the English language or with getting an education in America or in any of these Western countries. There's nothing wrong with much of the things that we enjoy in these countries. You know what is wrong? When we start taking values that are in contradiction to the values Allah gave us. That's what's wrong. That's what's unacceptable. And that is the biggest thing we're taking on. We don't take the good values from Western societies, because Western societies have some very good values. A lot of Western societies have more transparency in government, and they have more cleanliness on streets in many Muslim countries. They do. We don't learn that, because that's actually an originally Islamic value. What we do learn is, you know, the, the, how to dress, what music to listen to, what movies to watch. That's what we take in, and we swallow it whole. We take it all in. And we think we're somehow, we're, we're advanced, We've become more westernized. And westernized means more advanced. Westernized just means you're impressed with something that has no values. You have the, it has no values and you're so impressed with it. Like it's something so amazing. Like you're somehow more sophisticated than other people because of you, you listening to whatever garbage you're listening to. Or whatever garbage you're watching. Or whatever filth comes out of your mouth. Young man goes to high school in America, he comes from some Muslim country. He was, in his Muslim country, he was memorizing Qur'an, he was attending, you know, dars of hadith in the morning after Fajr, all of this stuff. And then he comes to America and he goes to high school. And in the first, he doesn't even speak much English. And he hears all the cursing and all the, all the filthy language and all the guys and girls together. And he's like, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah, astaghfirullah al-azim, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. The whole day he's like, what, am I, what is going on here? You know? But this is the first week, this is two weeks, this is three weeks. What happened six months later? You can't even tell him from the other non-Muslim kids. He assimilates, he accepts, man, this is how it's supposed to be. In the beginning he's disturbed, his fitrah rejects it, his Islam rejects it. 
But he says to himself, how much can I find it? It's everywhere, man. Let me just, come on, let me live my life. He just says, let me just be, be like these people. Let me just be like them, man. I don't, I, just want, I don't want to be different. People hate being different. These guys, the advice the brother gave to his brother was, man, we are different. Don't forget that. And don't be ashamed of being different. We're Muslims. So don't go back there, back into that lifestyle. And these guys had a taste of kufr first. And he, they knew what the lifestyle, what the thug life was like, what the gangster life was like, what the party life was like, what the clubbing was like. They knew. And they still don't want to go back because they know that Iman is sweeter than those things. And now we have a generation of Muslim kids, Muslim kids, that are born and raised in Muslim societies, that don't even have a value for the gift Allah has given them. Millata abikum Ibrahim. Yes, young man. Yes, young woman. You are different. You are different. You're not the same as everybody else. And what they have is not better than what you have. What you have, what Allah has given you is better. It is superior. You should feel sorry for the people who live that kind of life. You shouldn't want to be like them. You should feel sorry for them. You should wish they had what, you, what Allah has given you. You don't go to high school to assimilate. You go to high school to get others to Islam. Others should come to Islam because of you. You shouldn't go to Kufr because of them. We're supposed to turn this tide. We're supposed to change that. And every one of the young people listening to me in this crowd, every one of them, this is on your shoulders. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ We should be able to say that about it. Our young people, Allah says, no doubt about it, they were young people, they believed in their master. وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدًا And we increased them in guidance. He says, أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ They will integrate you, they will pull you back into their lifestyle, their religion, their values, and then you will start hating Islam. And you will start hating anybody who reminds you of it. You know, one of the most important things in this ayah that I didn't share with you, is they are talking to each other. A alim didn't come and give them a dars. A prophet didn't come and talk to them. They are guys, they're buddies, they're each other, they're bros. And they're talking to each other. We are learning when friends give each other sincere advice. It is very powerful. We are learning the value of friends watching out for each other. When you see one of your brothers falling off the deep end, and it's your job to pull him back, man. Your job, you're supposed to say, bro, come on. Let's go. What are you doing with your life? Let's talk. Let me take you out for dinner. What are you up with? Ah, bro, I just, I'm messed up. Doesn't matter, man. The doors of tawbah are open. Come on. Let's go. Let's go to the masjid and pray. You'll feel better. You're, you're, you can't give up on your brother. You can't give up on him. And you have to warn each other of the serious threats. Just because you guys, some of you guys hang out at the masjid, you attend all the halaqat, you attend all the courses that come into the city, and all this other stuff. So you're watching out for your deen, that doesn't mean you're safe. You're still supposed to warn each other, hey, I know you're supposed to go shopping, or you go to the mall, watch out man. Just don't go, just, how about, how about you go shopping somewhere else? Let's not go to the mall. We know what's at the mall. I know all those other guys are going for the movie, let's not go to the movie, let's not go. Let's just go somewhere else. You're supposed to look out for each other. إِنَّهُمْ إِنْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ يَرْجُمُوكُمْ أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ وَلَنْ تُفْلِقُوا إِذًا أَبَدًا And if that happens, you will never, ever, ever succeed. That's the final warning. The final warning is if they are successful in pulling you back, if they take you back into the way things were, if they make you live that life again, then you will never be successful. Then if, if that happens in that case, you're never ever going to attain success. And the last reminder I want to share with all of you and myself is the word Allah used subhanahu wa ta'ala for success. He says, لَن تُفْلِحُ الْإِفْلَاح Iflah in Arabic is related to the work of a farmer. Fallah. Fallah is the farmer. And the fallah has a very difficult life. Many of you have jobs. Maybe you get paid every week. Some of you get paid every two weeks, bi-weekly paycheck. Some of you get paid once a week. The farmer has a really tough job, guys. The farmer gets paid once a year. He works the entire year. The entire year. And then finally the crop comes, and then he gets paid. And the entire year of work, but if there are insects that eat away at his crop, if there's a flood and it washes away the plants, if there's, a too, there's not enough rain and the, the plants didn't get enough water, if the animals got sick and he wasn't able to till the soil, if any one of these problems happens, that one paycheck for the year is not gonna come. It's not gonna come. The farmer has one check per year. And he, whether he does all the work, it's still in the hands of Allah. 
Because he could do everything he wants. Every, all the bit of work that he could do, rain never came. He can't do anything about that. Insects came and ate all of his crop. He can't do anything about that. He can't. You know, it could even be a wind. فَأَصَابَهَا إِعْصَارٌ فِيهِ نَارٌ It could be a heavy wind that's got fire in it. You know? Or فِيهَا سِرْ فَأَهْلَكَتْهُ Allah said, another ayah he said, it could be a cold wind and it freezes the plants to death. But you know what? When a farmer reaches crop season and all the plants are tall and they're green and they're fresh and he's cutting them all over the world, when that season happens, farmers celebrate. They decorate the village. You know, they have festivals. You know why? Because finally all that labor is paying off. And at that moment when he's cutting the crop, that's when he's called Al-Fallah. From it we get the word Al-Muflih, the successful one. Meaning the guy who put in work, and work, and work. And he expected from Allah the blessings. And eventually at the end of the, all of that work, he finally gets his paycheck. By the use of that word, Allah is teaching us, Young men, young women, you have a lot of work ahead of you. And there's going to be one big paycheck at the end. So don't get disheartened if you don't see the results of your labor right away. This is the time to put in the work. And if you become, if you go back to that lifestyle, you will not be able to do the work. If you are the kind of person, you make a little bit of effort, and you want to see the results right away. Then you're never going to be a muflih. Because a muflih has to do a lot of work, and he only sees the results all the way at the end. You can't be impulsive. You can't be impulsive. This is the mentality a youth has to develop. In one ayah, Allah Azza wa Jalla has protected the culture of youth. In one ayah of Surah Al-Kahab. This is the 20th ayah of Surah Al-Kahab. I encourage the young people here, especially to memorize the beginning of this surah, and to reflect upon what Allah is saying through this surah to us. This is telling our story. It's not some historical incident only. It is telling our story. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect our young people from all kinds of fitna and make them a source of encouragement and strengthening in the deen for each other. May Allah Azza wa Jal make our youth those that the ummah itself is proud of and that they carry the flag of Islam the way it's supposed to be carried. May Allah Azza wa Jal make our, make our young people the examples of Islam to the rest of society. So instead of them being attracted to a life of kufr, those who are lost in kufr or drowning are attracted to them to the light of Islam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'li wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salam ala ibadihi alladhi nastafa خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا منقوتا